building were a science, not an art? What if anyone could learn to do it? Well, I'm here to tell you that you can. And the lessons I'm gonna to talk to you about will help you be a better schmoozer, whether it's for your private life, whether you need to work with someone different than you, or whether you're confronting a challenging situation. So let's get started. So a uh, poor schmoozing, it gets a bum rap. You know, oh, those guys are just schmoozing. Oh, that person's just a schmoozer. So I wanna elevate this concept a little bit. I wanna think of schmoozing as having a positive or pleasant conversation with someone that's driving toward a goal. And if you think of it that way, then a lot of things fall under the auspice of schmoozing, right? Uh, whether you're looking for a job and going on an interview, whether you're driving an Uber or a Lyft, whether you are trying to bring on a new client for your design firm, or whether you're negotiating the Paris Climate Accord. And I know I'm gonna get lots of emails from people saying that's not schmoozing, that's a negotiation. Yes, that's true. But just think about all the personal connections that have to go into even the most complex negotiations. So what do I know about this? Well, uh, first of all, my doctor is in rhetoric and what do uh, rhetoricians do? We think a lot about um, rhetorical situations, which really means play times when you have to communicate with someone, you have to think of the right thing to say. So um, that's what we do as rhetoricians. And you know, the other thing though, that's a little bit more important is that I actually have been a nonprofit fundraiser for 20 years. And what is that? Well, that means I have to work with a lot of people and talk to them about making a philanthropic contribution. So at my heyday, when I was a gift officer, I might be in a car uh, going back and forth from, from office to office, you know, meeting with four to six people in a day. And what I'm talking to them about is I'm trying to have a pleasant conversation, but also working toward the goal of getting them to make a gift or really parting with their money. So it's kind of challenging. And it's also challenging because you're with someone that might be uh, more experienced, more senior, uh, more suave, uh, you know, different gender, different political background, lots of ways in which I was very different from the people across the table, but yet my goal was the same. So, you know, fundraising is, um, if anything else, it's, it's schmoozing. And, you know, what I learned from it was really profound and I wanna share that with you. The other thing is that I'm a really shy person. I always thought I'd be a reading a book or have my head in a book or be an academic for my career. And I am not, so I had to learn and adapt. Um, when I started out, I was a grant writer in an office of a big university. And the person who was responsible for working with individual prospects and donors had a set of golf clubs in his office. And I thought, oh, I could never be, you know, work with individuals if you need to know how to golf and people just jet in and go, hey, let's hit the links and let me give you $2 million. Really, I bought into that sort of myth that, you know, what we do when we're schmoozing is it's really easy and it just happens naturally and either you have it or you don't. You know, there are people that are just naturally good at it or they just always know the right thing to say. And that's not true. And how I know it's not true is several years after that, I got invited to become a gift officer and work with individuals and ask them for support. And I saw my colleagues come back from a day on the road and they had their war stories and someone had said, oh, well, you're in the wrong office to be asking for that large of a gift. And they didn't quit or say, gosh, I did a bad job. They, they, they took that as an interesting uh, fact that they were gonna then go and use to find the right gift for that person. They got back up. People get back up when even a donor might be unhappy about what they said accidentally and even complain to your boss or something. That's that's really scary, right? You're like, oh, I guess I'll, I'll pack my bags now and, <laughs> and resign. But you know, people that pick themselves up and move past it and thought it was a learning experience. So what I learned was that schmoozing is not about a natural talent, it's about grit and perseverance. It's about learning how to do this. And there's someone named Angela Duckworth, who's a faculty member at the University of Pennsylvania who talks about grit and perseverance and has shown in certain contexts that it's more important than either emotional intelligence or your IQ towards success. And I can tell that's nowhere more true than in fundraising. So how do we do this? So first you adopt the frame of mind that I can do this. The second thing is you need to reverse engineer it. You're not just gonna wing it and say, well, I can do this, so let me just go wing it. And fundraisers, we, we reverse engineer everything. We have a goal. And then we figure out what kind of questions do we need to ask? What do we need to learn about this person in order to get to that goal? And it's, it's very micro level kind of stuff. 
but I want to leave you with a few things that we do as fundraisers that will help you in any kind of thing where you have to have this personal interaction towards some kind of a goal. And I'm going to start with the first zone, which is the icebreaker. So if you're uh, waiting for someone, you're like maybe in their office waiting for them to show up or something, you're in a restaurant, are you just going to be like checking your phone and kind of waiting for them? No, you're going to think like, what can I talk about to kind of break the ice and bring us a little bit closer together? So I have this nice cave art uh, that was done thousands of years ago because I want to remind you that we are all people and we all came from the same wonderful painting, painters and drawers and, and cave artists many, many years ago. So you want to look for something to kind of explore your common humanity, even if it's just as mundane as the weather. Just have something you can talk about. If you see something cool in their office, just mention, oh, I like that painting or whatever it is. Uh, one time I had just uh, became a new parent and my kid was like up all night and everything and had day night confusion. And so I went in and I was with uh, a donor, very prominent person that kind of said that, oh, well, he was like having trouble sleeping. So I go, oh, you must have day night confusion. And then I thought, did I just say that to this person? Um, like if he's not insulted and he thought it was hysterical, you know, cause it was so kind of off the cuff. But also because every parent, whether you were a parent 30 years ago, whether you were the primary parent or not, you know, whether you were uh, had a newborn like yesterday, we all remember that kid staying up in the middle of the night. So it, it brought us a little closer together. And I use that to move on and really build this wonderful kind of connection with this person. The first thing is that icebreaker. And the second thing is you fundraisers know we want to talk a maximum of 40% of the time and listen for at least 60% of the time, because that's how you learn about their motivations and what brought them to the table. So I have the picture of Everest up, because we all think we know like why people climb Everest. In fact, Tenzin Norgay said the pull of Everest was stronger than any other force on earth for him. Um, then you had George Mallory who was asked, oh, why were you trying to climb Everest? And he said, oh, because it was there. <laughs> well, that doesn't give you much to go on, but if you look back and kind of peel back the layers of that comment, you know he was talking about it being a remarkable human achievement. And he probably learned a lot through, through the, along the way if you wanted to climb Everest. So, you know, there's, there's things we can learn about people um, that you really should try and learn if you are wanting to kind of move forward toward a shared goal. And that is part of the theory of interest-based bargaining about learning about someone and what brings them there before you just kind of move on and do your pitch or whatnot. Uh, one time I was with a donor and I happened to say kind of intentionally, oh, you know, your colleague just joined this giving society and they're getting this really lovely plaque. And he jumps in and says, well, if Shelly has her name on a plaque, I want my name on a plaque too. So sometimes it'll be that easy. Sometimes you have to poke around a bit to get to know someone and understand what's bringing them to the table. And then the third thing is, well, at some point you are going to have to come back to you, the institution you represent, the company you're with, or your skill set if it's a job interview, and talk about yourself. And a lot of us think, oh, we're going to sort of pitch the institution or, you know, my, my, my hard skills or whatever. But you also want to bring a little bit of you into it. And that's why I have this cute little dog up here because dogs are great about, we, first of all, we think they're cute, but they're also great about, so they're great social interactors. They're always enthusiastic to see us, right? Or most dogs at least. But I want you to remember to create a, some kind of human connection when you're talking about this project and when you're talking about like why you're there. Um, I often got asked when I was at Yale Law School toward the beginning of my career, well, why are you um, wanting to work at Yale Law School? Because you're not a lawyer. Now, do you think they were just asking me to make small talk and just, you know, wanted to just kind of shoot the breeze? No, they wanted to know, like, why did I care? You know, it's why if you're in a job interview, they'll say, well, why, why do you want this position? They, they, you want to say something that, that shows that you know what that position's about or what that institution's about. And so, I would say, no, I'm not a lawyer, but I come from three generations of lawyers. And uh, before that, we were all farmers. So becoming lawyers and becoming a lawyer helped my family move into the middle class in this country. And it was so meaningful for them to practice law. My granddad was like the proudest man. He had his own law firm in our little town. And he was just so happy to say that he was a lawyer and have, hang that shingle out on his, um, on his door. And my dad was also happy to be a lawyer and to be able to use it to help people. So it meant a lot to our family and to me, and I benefited from it. And I want to share that and help people who want to study law and make it easier for them to do so. So that was my personal story. And you see, I didn't have this like obvious connection. So you can find your personal story in any situation if you just kind of think about it and try different things out and really see what it does mean to you. 
So again, we've talked about, you know, you can do this, adopt the right frame of mind. Then we talked about reverse engineering your situation. And then the third thing I wanna leave you with is expect the unexpected. My old boss used to say that, and I love it because you have to, you never know what's gonna happen. I could go on a whole day about random things that have happened to me um, when I've sat across the table from someone. And if you think, oh, I'm gonna expect the unexpected, then when it happens, you can roll with it. So like, if you can't find the right pair of shoes that you needed or, you know, the right watch or whatever it is to go that you just have your lucky charm there, but you can't find it, you still have to go to the meeting. You go, oh, that was the unexpected. I'm gonna go and do this. And, you know, one thing I do wanna say is that sometimes there are bad faith actors that you're gonna be seated across from and there are times when you want to end that conversation. Um, and you, it's not about thinking of the right thing to say. It is like you are being discriminating or making me uncomfortable or you're just being un unscrupulous and it is okay to leave the situation. Um, I wanna talk about the kind of, you know, unexpected things that just like you have to sort of roll with and 90 to 95% of the time you will have like that kind of situation where there is a good faith actor across the table. They're just asking a question that you don't know the answer to or something happens with your meal at the restaurant or whatever it may be. And you say, oh, that's the unexpected, I got you. And you just move forward. Uh, one thing that happened that was kind of, kind of funny was I was, uh, you know, with someone and it was like the end of the evening and you know, the gentleman said, oh, what are you doing? You know, this evening I'm going to the Met for this new premiere of something that I'd never heard of. And I said, well, I'm going to see the Black Panther. And you know, it was like the movie that was out. And I, I realized that I don't think he knew like what that was offhand. You were talking from high art to like pop culture. And it was really funny, and but he said the coolest thing, you know, I, I just sort of like sat back and I thought, well, I don't want to insult him by saying what it is if, if he already knew, but I don't think he does. So I just sat back, took a breath, said that was unexpected. And then he said the most cool thing. He said, well, that just sounds wonderful. I still don't know if he knew what it was, but he was trying to be kind about whatever the heck it was I had planned for this evening. And I had said the same thing to him about what it was that he had planned. And sometimes even if you can't quite bridge the gap of understanding, if you're just trying and putting forth an effort, that can really move you forward. The last unexpected thing that happened was a good thing where I had committed the cardinal sin. Um, I asked uh, for money from someone via email which, oh my gosh, you're not supposed to do, but this person was really, really busy and hard to meet with. But we noticed that every time a student wrote to him, he'd say, I'd love to mentor you, I'd love to help whatever, I love this institution. And I put all that together and I thought, you know, let me give this a shot. I didn't know if it would work. You don't always give things a shot when you know it's gonna work or you're confident or you have always the right thing to say or the right email to send. You know, you have to do it even if you're not sure. But I knew it was a good thing to try. So I wrote this, put together this kind of thoughtful email, put a lot of thought into you know, letting him know how much we were proud of him as an alum and asking him if he might uh, want to you know, honor this connection through an endowment uh, that he created. And a couple days later, he called me back and said he wanted to do that. And it was really, really instructive about like how you can kind of think outside of what your parameters are and do something if you kind of believe in it. But even if you're nervous or worried about it, you know, you can get better and you can learn. So, you know, what I want to leave you with is, of course, you know, adopt the right mindset, reverse engineer, expect the unexpected, and you're going to be great. You know why? The more you practice, the better you'll get. And that's because schmoozing is a science, not an art. Thank you very much.